as I say, you only got one life to live. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't like what you're doing, if you find it soul crushing or exceedingly tedious, you can go do other things. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Okay, welcome to Law Flip. It's an unfiltered conversation about law, life, politics, and so much more. I'm Benji Smith. So our guest today was educated at Harvard, Cambridge, and Berkeley. He represents California's 26th Uh, Senate District. He could have any job he wants, but he decided to commit his life to public service. So let's find out why. Excited to welcome Senator Ben Allen. Thank you for coming with us. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay, so to the listeners, please share this episode with people who you think will find it helpful. Let's flip the game upside down. So before we get started, Senator, I wanted to give some more attention to a new initiative we just launched. So we are trying to help a black lawyer start their own law firm. We've had so many people to offer free or discounted services. We've had free web services offered, free stationery. Uh, we're offering money and other resources and our office space. And what's crazy, we're having a challenging time finding applicants. And I think there's two reasons. One is, Uh, the legal profession is one of the least diverse uh, professions in the world. And two, even separate and apart from the lack of diversity, there's still an issue that people uh, have a hard time getting out of the rat race. They feel like it's basically a a high level robotic environment where you get into these law firms and you have a hard time getting out. And the idea of starting your own firm is super scary. So I guess my first question to you, Senator Allen, is what do you think we need to do to to change the lack of diversity in the legal profession? Well, I mean, it's a big it's a big question. And, um, you know, certainly not something that I'm a particular expert on. But but I I think, first of all, of course, it has to do with opening up opportunities up and down the educational system. Mm -hmm. Uh, And some of our failings, uh, 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 you know, uh, in in the K through 12 and, 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 uh, and undergraduate levels have certainly exacerbated this 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 problem. Sure. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that we know, if you come from the bottom quintile of wealth in our country, you have like a five or eight percent chance of getting a college degree. And if you come from the top quintile, you have a ninety five or ninety eight percent chance sure. of getting a college degree. So, you know, and of course nobody goes to law school without a college degree. So so there there's some there's some enormous existing um, disparities that we have. I think so those bigger structural challenges obviously need to be addressed, but I, I do think it does have to do with, with 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 creating more more um, you know role models for people, mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. a better job of going out and recruiting undergraduate students of of color, uh, you know folks from disadvantaged backgrounds to to consider going to law school. Um, it, it's all about building out the pipeline at every level, I would think. Sure. And we talk about education. Let's run through yours. So you went to Harvard undergrad, you went to Cambridge for your master's, and you got your law degree from Berkeley. All my second choices. Those are my backup schools. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, What do you attribute to obtaining the highest level of education for yourself? Well, you know, I I had advantages. I mean, they they weren't necessarily um, financial in the sense that my family's certainly not, you know, wealthy, wealthy, but uh, but my dad was a professor at UCLA. My mom was a school teacher, so I grew up around an in an academic environment, and so you know we had we had all the advantages that that entails, and, and that of course are 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 encouraged through the through the educational process. I had so I had parents who were who were incredibly engaged and they cared about me and they, they spoke and sang to me when I was a kid and read books with me. I'm, I'm raising my own little baby now and I'm seeing the kinds of things that I'm able to pass on to him uh, through our very proactive, engaged approach to, to his learning and his education. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that all that really benefited me. There's yeah. no question about it. Yeah. And you, I think you'd agree because you spend so much time on education that the system is essentially broken. Wouldn't you agree? For many people, yes. Do you still think it makes sense? Does higher education still make sense for the vast majority of Americans? Yes, I think we just need to do, I think there's certainly things we can tweak and need to hone and change around. But, uh, but, but certainly there is incredible value for our economy and for, our, uh, for, for so many of, of the important jobs and roles that we have to fill uh, into the future for higher level learning, for critical thinking, for all the kinds of, of higher level skills that a college education imparts. Sure. And so, uh, and of course, all, one thing we do know is that more and more jobs are requiring uh, you know, uh, some, some, some substantive form of higher education. So 
I, I certainly do think it, it makes sense, but I, I do think right now we have to deal with access. Um, you know, most other OECD countries, for example, provide free uh, mm -hmm. higher education for, 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 for their young people. And here, of course, we're now asking young people to accrue incredible amounts of debt. And I, I, you know, getting back to your earlier question about how to get more diversity through the pipeline, African Americans, et cetera, especially people coming from families where there's not a lot of uh, familial wealth, when we throw these enormous price tags in front of people and ask them to leverage their futures in the way that we do, I think it really discourages a yeah. lot of, of, of people with disadvantage, with, with, with less resources, uh, from, from wanting to pursue higher education. Yeah, I agree. And so you're a state senator. Probably the person most famous for being a state senator uh, is a personal hero, hero of mine, Barack Obama. And yeah. other than that, I think people, people know that about Barack Obama, but what does a state senator do? So we are we're we are members of the legislature for the state government. It's 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 basically the state version of what the members of Congress do in Washington. Uh, there are forty of us in here in the state of California, forty senators in California. So each of us represent about a million people apiece, and we pass laws, we write laws, we 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 deliberate over laws. We also provide oversight over the the federal government, and and we have hearings. Uh, we pass a budget. We just passed a budget a couple of days ago. And that that we did in coordination with the with the with the governor's office, and, and that funded everything from healthcare programs to education and, and our universities and and parks and, and roads and everything in between. So uh, we basically are the almost the board of directors, I suppose, for the state government. Uh, we pass the policies, laws, rules, and regulations that govern our state. Okay, of course. Any, any lawyer knows that, that actually the state, the state, well, it's funny. I mean, so much of law school focuses on federal law, but when you really get into it, the states have, the states have a lot of power in a lot of areas of our, of our life and economy. Yeah, absolutely. And you decided to be a, a sort of opt for public office. You could have had a cushy life and probably had made tons of money. And um, you, you opted for a life of public service. Why? It's very meaningful. It's, it's fulfilling. I, I get to wake up every morning and, and, and try to make the world a better place. And I know that sounds maybe a little trite, but it's true and, it, and, and it, it's motivating. And it's really interesting, too. I'll tell you, the, the diversity of issues that I get to work on on a daily basis. You know, I, I was obviously, I was someone who liked school, right? I liked, I liked going around from class to class and learning about a little bit of science and some math and some history and some literature. And, and that's kind of what my job is still. I, every day I'm, I'm working on everything from, I mean, just today. I, I had a, we, we were talking about, um, about family leave and the challenges that businesses have meeting our family leave um, uh, proposals. Uh, then we talked, then I was in another call about plastics and, and you know, pollution issues associated with, with, with plastics and wa some of our broader waste management challenges. Uh, and and no, now I'm talking to you about law issues. Later on today, I'm going to be on a, on a conference call with EDD, which is mm. our the folks who, who run our unemployment insurance system yep. talking about yep. the challenges of unemployment insurance. I mean, that's just, that's just this morning, right? <laughs> so every day I, I, get to, I get to delve into and learn about and try to help to fix an incredible range of societal problems. And it's just fascinating. Yeah, and I think you compare that to big firm life or most big corporate right. jobs, and maybe you can make more money, but oftentimes it's soul crushing and we can get into that a little bit later. But um, do we make public service attractive enough. We're super lucky to have someone like you, but um, you know, there's all sorts of um, parts of being in public life that are not so attractive. Do we do a good enough job? I mean, I think you even think about public school teachers and you take that to, a, to this you know, sort of analogy to being in public life as a state senator and, and even in federal or national politics. Do we do enough, a good enough job making public service attractive? Probably not, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I think um, we, we need our best and brightest to, to seriously consider public service. And, and um, you know, and you, and you think about uh, uh, the fact that so many of our, of, our, of our great talent ends up going into um, the private sector, which is not a bad thing. It just, it just I, I, I think, I think the, the financial incentives are so skewed mm -hmm. toward right. that path that I do think we end up missing out on a lot of talent that, that really could be devoted toward, 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 toward trying to achieve broader goals for our society. Yeah, and you, we referenced the private sector, and um, I know that you litigated at a big firm at the beginning of your career, and so I think you can understand why so many of our colleagues, and we talk about this a lot on this podcast, and maybe people 
are sick of hearing it, but it's kind of something that I think that bears repeating. A lot of our colleagues are not happy with the work that they're doing. And so do you have any advice for lawyers or, or kids in law school or really anybody in any profession that feels like they have to go down a given path because that's what society tells them to do? Yeah, this whole idea of society telling them to do, I, 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 it, it's, it's hard for me to, I mean, I, I wonder how much of that is really society telling them to do it or, or some sort of internal demon. Um, okay, a couple things. First of all, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with not just spending a little bit of time, but a lot of time in a private sector, um, high paid law firm job, if that's something that you find interesting, fulfilling. Um, I will say that if there's a seed of doubt in your mind that that may not be the long-term path for you, try not to build a financial model for yourself that is going to really make that job uh, 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 you know, uh, mandatory for you. Yeah. If you end up you know, starting to, to accrue costs or, or take on you know, mortgages and payments that, that you can only sustain if you have an ever-increasing uh, salary uh, that, that is, that is, that's, that's way beyond the, you know, the average person or average you know, professional's salary. It's going to be increasingly difficult for you to take a step off of that That's incredible. That that's incredible advice. That is, that, that is an often overlooked piece of this puzzle. Yeah, but if you keep your costs under control and you keep your planning under control, it really provides you with flexibility. And in the end of the day, you only live once, mm. right? I mean, it's, it's a, once again, it's an off-repeated statement. But do you want to spend your days every waking hour, you know, when you're, when you're working, working on things you find interesting and exciting and fulfilling? Or do you want to feel, uh, you know, do, do you want to feel bad about your work? I mean, that, that's, you know, you're, the, the kinds of folks that you're, we're talking to are too talented to get stuck in a, in a hole if, if, if that's, if that's a hole they don't want to be in. Oh, that's and, so and right. Yeah. We, I mean the, but the, even like when I, when I go back to my law school at Loyola, so many smart kids and I hear them talking about, you know, Oh, I want to work at a, at a big law firm because I want to have a great, a, a great, you know, place to live and a great, great car. And I'm like, it's just so upside down. And I think that's incredibly relevant, uh, good advice to be giving them. So right. how much time do they end up spending in that beautiful house? <laughs> that's exactly they right. They, and if they just took an Uber to work and lived in a, yeah, exactly. So, okay. So, so much of politics is messaging, essentially marketing. And so what's your process for packaging ideas? I think, first of all, you always have to think about what, uh, we can get so deep in the weeds as lawyers, as policymakers, any kind of expert. And so one of the most important things is remembering what the man or woman on the street, uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're ultimately the end consumer for your messaging. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I, like to, I like to float things by my mom and dad uh, who may not, you know, or, 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 or friends of mine who are not working in my profession. Uh, but I'm, I'm always trying to think about how to, it, it, by the way, this doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you dumb things down. Mm -hmm. It just means mm -hmm. you, you, you clarify and, and, and simplify and make your message more concise mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and approachable and understandable. And, um, you know, so, so for example, I just saw Lucy Jones. She was on, on NBC this weekend talking about uh, the pandemic. And of course, she's a famous uh, earthquake scientist. She's a seismologist. And so people thought, well, what's, he, what's she doing weighing in on, 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 the, on the COVID? Well, she's a, an expert communicator and she's a scientist. So she understands the basics. And she basically got up there and she said, the trick to fighting COVID is, is, is very simple. Don't share your air. And, you know, she really breaks it down. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, we could sit there and, 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 and you know, do a, a long exposition about all of the dep different epidemiological studies that have been done with regards to COVID. But in the end of the day, she did such a good job of crystallizing the core message. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's what, what political communicators need to do. And we need to do a better job of half the time, especially Democrats that end up getting so deep in the weeds sometimes on the, on, the, on the policy justifications that we forget the fact that we're trying to win over hearts and minds. Yeah, my dad always obsesses over brevity and he says, you know, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. Right. So, okay, right. so you're, you're, you've, you've been outspoken on Jewish issue, issues. We're both Jewish and proud Jews. Um, do Democrats do a poor job of messaging on the issue of Israel? In other words, do we make it clear enough when we criticize, say, this, the state or the, the, the government of Israel to make a distinction between that and our support generally for the state of Israel? 
I think I think the vast majority of Democrats do. I think um, you know, of course, there there are there are a handful of of Democratic elected officials that have uh, a different view about the the legitimacy of the state of Israel. Um, just like, by the way, there's a handful of Republican elected officials who've got some very out there uh, <laughs> opinions about Jewish people. You mean like and, Steve and, King or some? <laughs> yeah. So right. So so you know, but but the but the the vast majority of of and and, and it, it, of the Democratic elected officials and, and and Democratic leaders are absolutely unequivocal about their support uh, for the legitimacy of the state of Israel, but also recognizing the fact that it's another nation and they they have a government that, you know, certainly as being someone who's a Democrat who kind of tends a little more toward the center left, I I certainly uh, wish that. Uh, that, that the political spectrum in Israel had, had shifted so far uh, to the right. I mean, if you look at the, the nation there, it was, was built by, uh, by Zionist socialists, right? Mm-hmm. By, you know, the Labor Party and, um, you know, folks like Ben-Gurion and, and Onda Golda Meir and, and so many others. And so uh, I, I don't necessarily like the direction of, of some of the, the leadership that's happened there, but that, that certainly doesn't ever, uh, you know, call into question my, my support for and my belief in the importance of and the legitimacy of the state of Israel. And I think you know, nearly every Democratic elected official would, would be able to uh, espouses that 100 percent. Yeah, I think one of the frustrating parts is that, first of all, the vast majority of uh, Jews in the United States are liberal or are uh, Democrats. And so somehow we get tagged with uh, our, our, our the party gets tagged with being anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. And so they, you know, the Trump administration or the or the Republicans, they do do a good job of co-opting these like, you know, patriotic messages and we're for Israel. But like if you just peel back the onion, you'll just it's 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 not it's not real. But they do do a good job of like propagandizing and messaging. And I guess I wonder what we can do to a be- to do a better job to not fall victim to to those tactics. I think we just have to be we have to continue to be to be clear in our position. Uh, but I also think we have to point out some of the some of the BS going on, on the other side. I mean, you know, I, I, rem- I never forget that that comment when Trump went to the Republican Jewish coalition and he said, well, I've been having great conversations with your prime minister. And these are Americans, <laughs> right? These are these were Jewish people, but they were Americans. And like I love Israel, but I'm not an Israeli, right, right? Right. Like I, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, it's a good country. I, I will always go back there. I support that country, but I am not an Israeli. I'm an American, and my, my, my national leader is the president of the United States. As, you know, as as difficult as that is for me to say, right, given the current occupant, not the prime minister of Israel, and, um, you know, playing into this, uh, it, it's so interesting to see when they criticize people on the far left for questioning Jewish dual loyalties and yet they then play into those same tropes themselves yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and by the way that wasn't a fringe guy that was the president of the United States so so there, there's a lot of hypocrisy on the other side on this and, and 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 we probably ought to do a better job of pointing it out yeah absolutely so shifting to another subject you've you've authored several measures that have become law including ground a groundbreaking bill to boost vaccination rates among school children and so I wonder Another sort of controversial topic, anti-vaxxers or people that are, you know, skeptical, to say uh, the least, of, of yeah, I think vax- they're I think they're protesting outside the Capitol. Too, <laughs> so how hard is it for you to be a rational, reasonable, educated lawyer to have discussions with anti-vaxxers? Well, it depends on. I, well, that's a good question. Uh, I, I will say it. I've had lots of lots and lots of conversations, um, and 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 the conversations have gone very differently. There are those who are very difficult to talk to, and there are those who I think are just fearful and skeptical. And um, and I think I think it's it's my job to try to do my best to to treat every conversation I have with patience, with with an open heart, and with um, with with kindness, mm-hmm. and and, um, and 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 try my best to articulate where I'm coming from, and, and also hear them and hear their truth, even if it may be a truth that I just don't agree with. Have you ever seen a piece of legitimate evidence to support any anti-vaxxer position? Um, well, the only the only th- the, the 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 most the only thing I've seen 
is that we know that a very, very tiny portion of the population does have adverse reactions to vaccines. There's no question about that. Uh, we actually have, there's a fund at the federal level to help to compensate families whose kids have been uh, injured by those vaccines. Now, the folks who are on the anti-vax side, um, from my perspective, grossly over-exaggerate how many people are negatively impacted. But there, there, it is absolutely unequivocal that there is, a, there is a small portion of the population that should not get vaccinated. And by the way, it's because of that fact that we need everybody else to get vaccinated. Because there are some people who are immunocompromised or have some sort of reaction to the ingredients of the vaccines. And so they actually rely on everybody else being vaccinated to protect themselves because they should not be vaccinated. But you're, you're obviously convinced that the net benefit of having vaccination clearly exceeds whatever negative ramifications. There, negative there, ramifications. There's absolutely no question of that. And I, and I will say, um, you know, I like history a lot. And I go to, I like going to, you know, I'm a total nerd like this. I, I like watching history documentaries. I like going to like, um, you know, old presidential homes and um, old historic homes. And nearly every single major figure in history has some terrible tragedy of a child having died from some dangerous communicable disease that thank God we now have a vaccine for. Mm. Um, presidents of the United States, top, you know, uh, titans of industry, people who had access to, you know, all the best medical care of their day. And yet they lost loved ones unnecessarily, um, or at least, well, maybe not necessarily at the time, but, but, they, but, but the, the idea that, that uh, the world was, was not a dangerous place before we got vaccines uh, is just ridiculous. And they, and they say, oh, a lot of people say, oh, it's because of incre improved sanitation. Well, these are, you know, these, these are folks who, who, who had good sanitation. Right. And, uh, and, and yet we didn't have the tools to prevent these vaccines, to pre prevent these dangerous communicable diseases from spreading through society. And, you know, I can only, I look at my, my own father's example. He was a little boy and got polio right before the vaccine uh, became uh, available. And he spent his entire life not having enough strength in his arms to break his own fall. Thank God he's been able to live a successful, happy, uh, a, a wonderful life. And I'm so, I'm so fortunate to still have him. But he's certainly been impacted. And I think of, of some of the people that he grew up with who were not so lucky. And yet that was long enough ago that a lot of people forget mm. about those days. And, and I just think that as much, as part of what's hard about having been involved with a bill like this is that the vast majority of, of people will never know the benefits that, that right. we were able to, 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 to We're to a give victim to of our own success. Us. Exactly. We get all the anger from the people who are mad about us doing it. But, you know, the, 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 the person who, who you know, who, who's going to grow up not having, not having to suffer like my father did from polio or from another dangerous communicable disease because they uh, had the vaccine or because we created enough community immunity, um, you know, those people will never know what, uh, 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 they'll, they'll never know, uh, they'll, they'll never, they'll never full, fully grasp the benefits that they've gotten as a result of our having taken strong steps to improve vaccination rates. Yeah, my, my brilliant doctor friend Ronan Nazarian made that very point on the show and it's, it's well taken. So California, one of the greatest places in the world to live, particularly Los Angeles and the surrounding areas, two major issues that I always tell people when you're coming to move here, these are the things you need to be worried about. Traffic, cost of living. What are you doing about those two things, Senator? Yeah, great question. I mean, there's certainly, the bane of my district's existence. Now, of course, you know, these days the traffic is pretty amazing. Um, right. It reminds me of when I was a little kid and you could like flit across Santa Monica oh. in 10 minutes. I mean, that, that's just not, not possible anymore during normal, under normal circumstances. I mean, I, I do wonder whether COVID is going to reshift a lot of conversations about telecommuting and just the need to be, you know, in that nine to five or in the case of most lawyers, nine to nine to nine. 10. To nine. Yeah. Nine to nine, um, uh, uh, you know, time period at, at, at a physical office away from your home. But um, look, I've been a big, passionate supporter for transit. I, you know, my father's English. Uh, we would go to, to London from time to time when I was a kid. Um, my mom's from the East Coast, and I, I spent time living in Washington, D.C. I went to, I also spent some time in the Bay Area and, and just, you know, spent some time in New York as well and, and Boston. I mean, these cities that have great public transportation systems that really make a difference in terms of getting around. By the way, I don't believe that building out an enormous metro system in LA is going to mean that traffic is going to go away. But what it does mean is it will give people alternatives. It means that the idea of like going to a Dodger game 
from Santa Monica during rush hour, it just doesn't seem quite as daunting because you can hop on the train instead of having to sit in the 10 on the 10 sure. for sure. for an hour and a half uh, and and just tear your hair out. And so one of the things that I did, and I did this in conjunction with um, the, the senator from San Francisco, when there was this attempt to pass a gas tax, which you know I really did believe was necessary, and I do continue to believe was necessary because there was so much infrastructural need out there, uh, you know, potholes and bridges. I mean, something like half of the bridges in uh, uh, in, in the state of California at the time were 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 not didn't meet the the, the key um, seismic safety standards that we needed to meet. And so we really needed to up our game and start to improve our infrastructure and our, and our roads. But I also said, if we're gonna do this, we have to put some money toward public transportation build out. And we were able to get $600 million a year just to go to building out our public transportation systems. And, um, and that's something I'm really passionate about, trying to, to, to just supercharge the build out in Los yeah. Angeles. And yeah. I've been providing whatever support I can to our partners on the ground in the county and the city to, to make sure we get as much of a, of a transit build out in place. I actually have a bill related to this right now to help Metro meet its goals in, in advance of the 2028 Olympics. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a really big thing. Um, housing costs are so difficult. And, and, and I really do think ultimately it has to do with uh, trying to provide more supply, but more smart supply, supply that really is transit oriented, supply that involves people you know, living closer to where they work. Mm. And, uh, you know, we could build as much supply as we want out in like, you know, Newhall Ranch or Tejon or Santa Clarita. And if all those folks are going to be uh, clogging the freeways and coming to big work centers in Century City and Santa Monica and downtown, uh, it'll continue to exacerbate the, tra the, tra the traffic problems that we were just talking about and, and, and continue this pattern of people spending so much of their time uh, behind the wheel as opposed to with their families or at work or being productive or, or being able to rest or, or engage in leisure. So, so I think it's about, uh, it's, from, my, from my perspective, it's about a calibrated and careful but, but proactive approach to pushing a pro-housing agenda, uh, but also one that, that, that doesn't, um, that, 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 is, that, 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 I mean, ideally from my perspective, it involves um, creating a system where local communities have control over, but also an impetus to, uh, as, to, as to how their housing is built out. A financial impetus or and still keeping real estate investors m motivated to be doing real estate investment? Yes. Yes. And, and so some of that has to do with everything from looking at um, our California Environmental Quality Act. And I'm a, I'm a passionate environmentalist. And I really want to make sure the Environmental Quality Act really, you know, focuses on the environmental quality goals that were at the heart of that of that measure, as mm -hmm. opposed to it being used as a leverage game by one group or another. Sure. Um, so, so things like that, uh, things like um, you know, incentivizing you know more housing, pushing cities and counties to create you know to 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 put in place the sorts of zoning rules to allow for more housing. Um, but 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 from my perspective, that ought to be done. We ought, we ought to encourage the locals to do it as opposed to the state kind of coming down with a one size fits all model that that dictates zoning statewide. Yeah, that I makes think that's sense. Something that's been proposed by some of my colleagues because they're so frustrated. Uh, but I, I, I really think there's a, there's a happy medium here that we can find. Moderation. That's not something yep. that we hear a lot, but it makes a lot of I sense. <laughs> so I you know, authored. It's a, lonely, a it's a lonely place to be. <laughs> so you authored a first in the nation public lands protections bill. I mean, look. I've recently become obsessed with Joshua Tree. But, uh, cool. But why do we care about public lands? Such a great, you know, why do we care about public lands? There's so many different ways to answer that question. I mean, one of them, obviously, there's, we, are, we are, whether we like it or not, uh, we are part of a broader ecosystem, and we really do depend on the health of our planet to, uh, to, to live and breathe and eat. And so, uh, you know, preservation of, 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 of land allows for at least some semblance of natural processes to continue mm. uh, in, 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 in ways that we know will be beneficial for future generations. Uh, and, you know, you, you talk about how you're a fan of Joshua Tree, you, you know, living in a city as big and bad as Los Angeles, uh, with all of the madness of city life, and I love LA and I love my town, and, and, but, but at the end of the day, part of what makes Los Angeles livable and a place where I'm excited about raising my kids is the fact that I've got places to go like the beach. I've got yeah. the Santa Monica yeah. Mountains. I've got places like Joshua Tree to go to. 
uh, and, and, and be able to, to, to experience the wonder of nature and get the spiritual high that comes from that. My father would take me on a hike up in the Santa Monica Mountains every single weekend when I was a kid. And I'm getting, I'm getting uh, goosebumps thinking about it because of, it was such a meaningful part of, my, of my, my childhood. It gave me really meaningful bonding time with my father. But it also, it, was able, it, it gave me a, ch a, a chance to just cut off my, my, the, the daily routine and go somewhere and be inspired by the wonders of nature. And it gave me a deep appreciation for biology and for science. Uh, uh, but it also gave me, uh, 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 it, it connected, it gave me a, a, a spiritual and psychological boost that I think uh, was, was really powerful for me too. And, and I will say that, you know, that, that, that as, as much as it, you know, places like Joshua Tree, places like the Santa Monica Mountains, they're not just preserved, they, they don't just kind of come down to us preserved uh, 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 per se, even though of course they should be. It's because People got together and organized local activists teaming up with politicians to, to fight against local landed interests and business interests and developers and others to, to say, hey, we, you know, some places are sacred. We need open space. We need preservation of space you know, for, for, for future generations. And so one of my inspirations for even getting involved with public office is this gentleman named Tony Bielinson. And he was a member of Congress um, who, in 1978, teamed up with a group of activists, and he got the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area passed through the Congress. That was the year I was born, 1978. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and was able to create this national park zone in the Santa Monica Mountains that is, is basically a gift that keeps on giving to generations of, of kids. And now you start getting up on those trails, you see black and brown kids, you see Asian you know, families, you see older folks. I mean, you see this wonderful smorgasbord of Los Angeles out on those trails. And a lot of these are families coming from areas that are packed in, where they don't have a lot of opportunities for outdoor recreation. And thank God that people had the vision and the foresight uh, in previous generations to preserve and protect that space for them to enjoy. And they're going to take their kids up there and they're going to develop a greater love and respect for nature, hopefully become, you know, uh, good environmentalists, and, and, um, and, and, and it becomes a virtuous, a virtuous cycle. Listen, folks, if you're not inspired uh, and in awe of Senator Ben Allen after listening to him for the past 30 minutes, I don't know what it's going to do, but I, I wonder, can someone like you, smart, reasonable, very reasonable, um, passionate, is there uh, any hope that we can ask you to do something crazy like run for higher office in the future? Or are you are you too reasonable and smart for that? I, I mean, I I'm I'm enjoying this work. It's it's stressful a lot, and uh, I, I but I, I certainly see myself. You know, well, as long as I can convince my wife, uh, I I I, uh, I I definitely I definitely want to continue in public service in some in some form or another. It might be running for for higher office, or or, or might be something else. But but I, I really I've I think I've found a passion here for myself. And I really, you know, in spite of all the, the financial disincentives that you talked about earlier, uh, it, it, it really, um, it, it's very fulfilling for me in, in, in a lot of ways. And so I want to keep doing this. You work. heard it here, folks. President Ben Allen in what, 2024, 2028. We'll, we'll replay this then. So, okay, so let's move on to deal of the week. Okay, my deal of the week, Senator, is again, last week it was vote, it's again vote. Every day under this administration, the country sinks lower and lower. You have a say in this, people. You have a say in this. Our friend Mondana was on last week. She started I Am A Voter. You text VOTER to 26797. It is a mandate. You must go out and vote. If you can't figure it out, I'd be surprised, but call us text us, email us, we'll help you figure it out. Senator Ben Allen, what's your deal of the week? Well, I was going to, I was going to talk about an app, but, uh, <laughs> but now you're talking about voting. I mean, I got it. Now, now you really, um, uh, I, you know, I, I take I guess the fun I out of say, deal of the week. I took the fun out of deal of the week. Louis. Yeah. Well, I'll, um, I'll So let me be serious. And let me, let me tell you about something fun. Um, the serious side is uh, of course, go vote, but also get involved. If there is a candidate that you that you believe in, or a cause, or a proposition, or a measure that you believe in, get involved. They, you know, can, campaigns need help, right? It's not just about yes, we need you to go out and vote. That's the number one thing. There's no question about it. 
But there are, uh, but 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 if you want, if you're inspired by the moment of 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 trying to change our country for the better in this election, and, and God, we, we we desperately need people to, to to get inspired in this moment. Campaigns need help. They need financial contributions. They need. Uh, they need volunteers. It's going to be a really weird time now with COVID, so we're going to have to figure out different ways to reach out to voters. But having people make phone calls into, you know, into, into competitive states and swing states and, and, and swing districts is going to be vitally important. So, so, so yes, vote, but try to take it to the next level mm. and get more involved. That's great. Okay, what's the fun deal of the week? Oh, the fun app. You know, um, so I love to travel. And, uh, and, and actually, because of COVID, I've been driving back and forth between Sacramento and LA. I used to fly all the time, but, but I've got elderly parents. I like to see them. I like to hang out in the backyard. And I'm, you know, and I, I, we socially distance, but nevertheless, I, I really am trying to be careful. So um, anyway, people think of the Central Valley as, like, people in LA think of the Central Valley as just a ribbon of highway that you got to power through. And uh, it turns out there's actually, if, 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 to some extent, that's true. But there's actually a lot of interesting things in the valley, and I've gotten this um, Lonely Planet, which is of course is a you know world travel guide, for about forty bucks or something. You can download an app. I know it sounds a little steep, but literally it will it provides you with a guide, a Lonely Planet guide to every city in the world wow. that Lonely Planet has written about, including sites to see, restaurants, hotels, you know, entertainment, a little map. And, and by the way, the cities include cities as small as Lodi and Stockton. So it's not just Paris and London. So basically every significant uh, city in the world, you get, you get like the full Lonely Planet experience. And I've been having so much fun, you know, especially if I'm driving with my baby, where we, where we have to do you know, frequent stops because you know, he's, not, he's not into kind of sitting in one place for six hours. Babies are not into that. Yeah, they're not into that. So what I've done is I've like researched the route. We've been taking Highway 99 sometimes. Uh, and, 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 and we just, it's all these cool towns and you just find interesting little things to do along the way. And, um, it just makes it, it just makes it a little more fun and you and, and it opens up, uh, it opens up places and experiences that, that you might not necessarily, uh, know about. So it's called cities guides. I think, I mean, I found about, I found out about this cool farm where we went and we like picked blueberries and, and plums and, and all the rest. And, and I know people don't want to pay for things, but, but it, these are curated. Like, this isn't just a, this isn't crowdsourced. These are actually, everything in the app is, 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 is recommended and, and checked out by, by a travel writer. So this is sponsored by our firm, Smith & Benowitz, and we do employment, personal injury, and class action law. So we do a segment called Karen's at work where we point out the different ways that Karen's are making things unnecessarily difficult for employees. We all know what Karen's are. And so I think the broader point that I want to make is a lot of times employers, um, they mandate that their employees take on expenses that are really, um, the employer's responsibility. And I want to use a small, but, uh, illustrative example. So right now we got a call where a, an employee is saying that like the, their, the employer is mandating that the employees wash their hands at work, which is a very smart thing to do, but instead right. of letting them do it during work time, they're forcing them to do it during, uh, the employees rest breaks. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal. It sounds nitpicky, but the problem is you have to stop these things because they just there's a it's a slippery slope and so a lot of times employers they basically shift the responsibility their responsibility onto employees so if your employer if your employers are doing that do not let it happen report it and contact an experienced uh, employment law firm like ourselves and we'll be happy to talk senator ben allen what's your legal tip of the week well, so I, you know, I, I was thinking a little about this. I, uh, I guess as a legislator, I, I'm, 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 I, got, I felt the need to, to say this. And this is that when we all go to law school and you learn about the majesty of the law and, um, and, and all this, this attempt to try to discern the intent behind the law. And I would just say, as, as having now spent six years in the sausage factory, <laughs> uh, lawmaking factory of the Capitol, it is very difficult to really pinpoint legislative intent on, on law because in the end of the day, you've got at the, at, the, at the least 121, so 80 assembly, 40 senators, one governor, 121 people weighing in on, on, on pieces of legislation. 
And lots of different people may vote for the exact same bill, but for very different reasons. Mm. And so uh, I, it's something I think a lot about. And I, I, you know, if I ever get to revisit my law school experience or teach or something, um, I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'll challenge some of the things that, um, that, that, that that that, uh, that that my law that my law books or law professors talked about with regards to the intent of the law. Yeah, that's actually an interesting conversation for a few of us. For a lot of people, they're like, "What the heck are we talking about?" But for for some of us that went to law school, it's definitely a relevant, interesting conversation. And thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so we learned a lot today. I learned that. Uh, you are an incredibly engaging person that has a passion to move this country forward. And we really appreciate all the effort that you're making on our behalf as Californians. And I, I appreciate you putting aside your maybe your individual, personal financial motives to serve the country. And it's very honorable and we appreciate it. And so I would ask you, uh, for the people out there, how can they engage with you? How can they contact you? And any parting words for the Law Flip audience? Oh, thank well, thank thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I I, I appreciate you saying all that. I will say, I, I do, I really do feel honored and blessed to have been given this opportunity. I mean, you're right. There there are downsides to this job, but um, but I, I really it, I I there there are some real upsides too. And and I it's not lost on me that this is a privilege that I've been granted by the voters on my district to be able to to do this work. And there were other people who wanted this job and, and, um, and very capable, talented, good people who wanted this job as well. And so I'm, I, I, don't, I don't take it for granted. And uh, I appreciate your comments, but I, but I do ultimately also believe that, that you know, I'm the lucky guy here being able to, to do this work. Um, anyway, I, you know, we're, we are, our, our, doors are, our virtual doors are open. Uh, we certainly want to help people. Uh, we've got an office uh, in the South Bay. Um, our, so so the, the, the email to use is senator.allen, A-L-L-E-N, at senate.ca for California, dot gov. So senator.allen at senate.ca.gov. Um, you may get a bounce back just to let you know that it's been received, and, but we check every email and get back to everybody. And, 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 I, and I just say, like, do not hesitate to reach out to us, uh, to engage with us. And, um, you know, if you have, you know, literally today, for example, we're having this, this town hall uh, with regards to unemployment insurance. Every single day we're helping solve difficult problems for our constituents. And so, you know, please, please do reach out and, and, and engage with our office. And, and um, we've got a great team. The other thing I should say to you, by the way, you're, you're, you're saying all these nice things about the elected official. Don't forget the elected officials have these, these wonderful staffs that work really hard. They're public servants too. I've actually got a couple, a, a, couple, a number of, um, of lawyers on my staff, including one who used to be a lawyer at Skadden. Mm -hmm. And now she's my district director down in LA and certainly not getting paid as well as she used to. But, um, but I, I think she would probably tell you some of the same things that I said, that you know, there's, there's a lot of other um, compensation, kind of spiritual compensation that comes from doing this kind of work. Yeah, and we dealt with uh, Shannon and Gina from your office and they were awesome to deal with. And cool. uh, I'm sure the rest of your staff is amazing too. Uh, yeah. So any, any parting words, uh, for the law flip audience? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess I, 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 I worked in a law firm myself, um, learned a lot, uh, you know, was certainly able to, it also, I will say I built up a, a little bit of a nest egg, which was very helpful for me when I was running for office and, yeah. and you know, had to take off some time and was not working with the salary while, while I was going full time running for office. Um, so, so I, I'm, I'm glad to have had that experience, and I had some great colleagues at, at my firm. Uh, but, but there's no doubt in my mind if, if, if you know, as I say, you only got one life to live, yeah. Yeah. and um, if, if, if you don't like what you're doing, if you find it soul crushing or, or um, you know, exceedingly tedious, you got talent. There's a reason why you're getting paid so well right now. It, you know, it, it, those of you who've gone to make that that decision to go work in a fancy law firm, um, you can go do other things, and you might not get compensated as well financially. But uh, there there are other forms of compensation. So, and 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 and, that, and by the way, for those of you who actually do want to stick with the job and and want to uh, uh, want to keep it going, there are other you know give make sure to give back, right? Yeah. I mean, there are other ways to make sure that all your hard work is going to go to a good cause. Get involved with a charity. Get on. Uh, get onto a board. 
Um, get involved with campaigns. I mean, you know, if, if there's a politician that you like and respect and want to support, uh, you know, your expertise, your passion, your talent, you, know, you don't have to leave your job to be able to do some other cool things. Uh, we've got government boards and commissions, school districts need help, you know, uh, you know, for education foundations. There's lots and lots of ways to get more involved with the community. And I will say, it used to be that lawyers were kind of the paragons of the local community. They'd be the guys who, you know, the guys and gals used to be guys, I guess, more than anything else, who would, you know, yeah, they'd have their law practice, but they'd also be, you know, the head of the Rotary Club or right. the chairman of the school board. Uh, and, and they would be, con you know, they would be, they would be giving back. There'd be a lot of public service that would, that would dovetail with their, with their legal profession. Unfortunately, so many of our, of our friends, our, our colleagues in law have really, they're so, they're so deep into the law practice that they kind of, you know, lose a little sight. Uh, they they, they kind of miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. Take those skills, take that expertise and, and, and spend some time giving back as well. Thank you so much. This was really, really uh, inspiring, and I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank Senator. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Happy to, happy to come on anytime. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Okay, so Arian, they're asking where they could find us. So for Law Flip, it's at Law Flip and lawflip.com. For Smith & Benowitz, our law firm, which does personal injury employment and class actions, you can find us at at Smith Benowitz and smithbenowitz.com. For the personal stuff, like where you're really going to find the juicy stuff, at Benji Smith and benjismith.com, at Wages Guru and lewisbenowitz.com for Lewis. Oh, so Law Flip is produced, directed, and edited by the young legend Aryan Tabibi and visual effects and compositions by another young legend, Oren Azad. Intro music provided by Pen Practice. Pen Practice, what is it? Premium instrumentals for upcoming artists by the music industry's top producers. For more info, visit penpracticemusic.com. I had so much fun recording the intro song with my man Hilton Deuce Wright. Looking forward to hearing more and more from Pen Practice. So the Law Flip identity, this hot logo that you're looking at, created by Garrett Whiston and Travis Nagel. Special thank you to Shy and Seth from the Horwitz Marketing Agency. A huge thank you to Aaron and Vanessa from Smith & Benowitz for endlessly dealing with all of our podcast bullshit. And lastly, a huge thank you to our beautiful wives, Julie and Lisa, for supporting our vision and all the love to all of our four boys combined. Disclaimer, this podcast is made available by Smith & Benowitz for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is only intended to provide general information and opinions about legal and other concepts and is not intended to be used as a source of legal advice or relied on for legal advice. By listening to this podcast, you understand that no attorney-client relationship is being formed between you and Smith & Benowitz or any of its attorneys. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state.